Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Marion Levy, Associate Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Memphis. And on behalf of the University of Memphis, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series on telehealth for vulnerable populations. As the COVID-19 pandemic uh, spreads across the world, now over 400,000 individuals have died across the world and more than 110,000 individuals in the United States alone. The more we know now that the dis there's a disproportionate impact on racial, ethnic, and underserved communities in terms of physical, mental, and even financial health. On a positive note, telehealth has become a vehicle for expanding access to healthcare for underserved and vulnerable populations. So our goal with this series of webinars is to share best practices and lessons learned so that we can not only expand access of healthcare to vulnerable populations, but improve it and improve the quality so it's culturally relevant, effective, and empowering. So to this end, uh, the University of Memphis has a series of six one-hour webinars uh, related to telehealth for vulnerable populations. The topic of today's webinar is telehealth, is training health profession students via remote learning. We have a set of expert panelists, a multidisciplinary panel in the fields of social work, behavior analysis, and nursing. I'd like to introduce them now. Dr. Susan Ellswick is our first speaker. She's an associate professor at the University of Memphis in the School of Social Work. She's the School Social Work Certificate Coordinator for the University of Memphis. Dr. Ellswick has over 16 years of clinical mental health experience that includes community mental health, case management, residential training programming, school gate based programming, integrated behavioral health, infant mental health, and home based services. Our second speaker is Annie Cornelius, the project coordinator at Umbrella, where she provides services and parent training to local families of children with autism while also supervising students who are completing ABA coursework at the University of Memphis. And he's currently the president-elect of the Tennessee Association for Behavior Analysis. And our third speaker is Dr. Belinda Fleming, a clinical associate professor and director of the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at the Lowenberg College of Nursing at the University of Memphis, where she has implemented several new clinical teaching strategies Dr. Fleming has been a nurse practitioner for the past 30 years and has worked in many areas of advanced practice, urban and rural settings, primary care, skilled facilities, and specialty clinics. I'd like to acknowledge the FedEx Institute who is hosting this uh, series of webinars, as well as our partners at this endeavor. And before we begin, I'd like to um, share some housekeeping information. Each panelist will speak for around 10 minutes, and at the end of the three presentations, we'll take questions. So during the, the proceedings, feel free to type your questions into the question and answer box and indicate which speaker you're addressing the question to. And after the webinar, we'll send you a link to the presentations and also a brief survey that we hope you will complete to provide feedback to us. If you want to receive a CEU credit for social work, behavior analysis, or public health, you must complete the survey. Speaking of behavior analysis, we have the check-in uh, code for behavior analysis CEUs is 4094. So it's now my pleasure to turn the program over to our first panelist, Dr. Susan Ellswick. All right. Again, thank you guys for joining today. Um, I'm going to kind of start us off by talking about uh, what we hope to gain from uh, knowledge from this, this um, webinar. We're going to talk about the understanding and need and purpose to train students in telehealth programming. Many of us understand the need now after COVID-19 that there is a need to embed this into our curriculum and content to prepare students uh, for a future of telehealth programming. Also to be more knowledgeable about the different types of telehealth programming that exist, as well as best practices in training students in telehealth programming. So what is telehealth? That's kind of where we start with our students. Many students uh, are familiar with it now just because of what we've been going through, but they may not completely understand the purpose of telehealth and how it can be beneficial to their clients. 
So when we think about telehealth, it's really uh, the use of a telehealth platform or a platform that is computerized to assist with supporting behavioral health, mental health needs of individuals directly from their home environment. Um, that can be provided from a therapist, a medical professional, a psychiatrist, a board certified behavior analyst, with the use of a technology of a web camera and a microphone and the ability to communicate back and forth between our patient. Uh, that can be done with a desktop or a laptop, an iPad, notebook, tablet, iPhone, or smartphone. What we found across the nation is many families have access to smart technology smartphones. So even if they don't have a laptop or a desktop, they can use their phones as a service delivery option, which actually enhances the ability for us to reach more families, uh, children, adolescents, and adults that are in need. We also understand that telehealth is important because it breaks down specific barriers to service delivery we often find within the community. Some of those barriers include stigma, especially around mental and behavioral health. Uh, a lot of clients don't want to go into a counseling office to receive service delivery. And so doing telehealth from your home environment actually decreases that stigma. We also know that there are financial burdens on our families that limit their ability to access health care and mental health care. Telehealth can also assist with that. Lack of access of service delivery in specific parts of the region. We know that rural areas really struggle with getting licensed and board certified clinicians in their area to provide service delivery. So telehealth helps to break down that barrier because the service delivery can be provided to that family in their home environment and the therapist could be hundreds of miles away. Uh, we also understand that transportation is a huge limitation for many of our families. So telehealth again also helps to break down that specific barrier. So when we think about service delivery and being able to offer services to individuals who don't typically have access to service delivery, we understand that there is a large discrepancy across the nation uh, in what we call a workforce development. And we here in the Memphis region are a health and mental health shortage region, which means we don't have enough clinicians to serve the need within our current population around health needs and behavioral health needs. So when we think about the statistics uh, globally, about one in five adults are actually identified as having some form of mental health need. But of, of that population, only about 60% actually ever receive services because they don't seek services because of some of the stigma that we just discussed. So in, on top of being in a shortage region, we also understand that services oftentimes aren't offered uh, in certain locations. So telehealth is definitely needed in order to address those specific discrepancies across the nation. Um, when we think about telehealth, it's a growing trend. Uh, some people are kind of afraid to start moving towards telehealth programming because they're fearful of whether or not it's um, as effective as face-to-face -face treatment. There is a ton of research to show that it is just as effective as face-to-face -face treatment and actually we get a better um, uh, contacts with our clients and when we offer telehealth for those who possibly wouldn't go to the doctor or wouldn't go to their mental health practitioner because it's 40 miles away, we're more likely co to connect with that client and that patient more readily through a telehealth model. It improves access to care and it removes barriers. So many times our students, when we're educating them within our programs, they want to know, why would I do telehealth? I really would prefer to see the client face to face. Yes, you know, that would be optimal. However, there are certain situations where telehealth is actually going to be the better choice for you and for the clients and patients that you're serving. So we have to let our students know why it's important, how it's assisting with breaking down some of those specific barriers so that we can give them a framework for why we're starting to embed this content and information into our curriculum. So when we think about telehealth, there's lots of terminology out there that's used. Um, there is something telepsychiatry where individuals could get their um, psychiatric needs uh, for med management addressed through a telehealth uh, portal. Telepsychology, that would be provided by a, a clinical psychologist that's approved within that state to provide telehealth programming. Telehealth generally talks about primary care. <clears throat> so integrated behavioral health within a medical model. Telepharmacy uh, is another uh, system that's often used. And then for the behavioral and mental health world, telebehavioral health is what we would consider telehealth programming. So there's lots of terms that are thrown around and it's really important for us to educate our students about the differences in those terms, as well as the differences in the service delivery provided. 
So when we start to think about talking to our students and educating them about telehealth, we have to prepare them for what do they need to know before they start utilizing telehealth in practice. So things for students to consider, first the technology piece, the things that they need in order to provide effective service delivery through a telehealth format. They need to make sure they have microphone and noise canceling headphones are best. That way that they can really hear the client or the patient from, from across the, the technology divide. Uh, we need video cameras that are able to be seen. We need to be able to see the client, especially in behavioral and mental health and medical fields. We need to visibly see the client or the patient to know that we're addressing all the specific needs. A client may tell me, no, I'm super, I'm fine, I'm fine, but their face is telling me something different. Their body language is telling me something different. So having access to that video camera is super important. Uh, making sure that you set your room up so there's no shadows, that you can really be seen, that there's enough light in the room so that the individual can see your face. A quiet confidential space, not just for you as the clinician, we have to educate the client and the patient that they too need a quiet confidential space in order to provide that service delivery. Um, for behavioral and mental health, we're often talking about very sensitive topics and in the medical field too, and we want to make sure that we're maintaining that confidentiality for that individual. So discussing with them the importance of having a safe space in their home environment in order to utilize telehealth. Um, for you as the practitioner, you need to set up a room that has very limited and minimal visual and audio distractions. Um, today I am in this presentation at my office instead of my home environment because I have three dogs. And so I don't want you hearing my dogs yapping in the background. So really thinking about where are you setting this space up to really make sure it's optimal. Uh, we also need to think about backup plan. Um, what if the technology doesn't work? And that will happen. You're going to uh, get on a session with a client and in the middle of the session, you're gonna get a glitch, there's gonna be a power outage, something's gonna happen. So establishing on the front end a backup plan with your client. If we have technology difficulties, this is what we'll do. So that's more than likely gonna be a phone contact and you'll just let them know if we get disconnected for any reason or there is a lag that's occurring, I will stop the session and call you on the phone and we can complete our session that way. So having a backup plan. And then also remembering that we really need to maintain HIPAA compliance uh, when we're providing these services wherever we are remotely. And so you need to make sure that the platform that you choose is a HIPAA compliant platform. Other things that we need our students to start to consider as they're thinking about telehealth programming, identifying whether or not the client even has the accessibility to do telehealth in their home. So we're really encouraging uh, students as we're training them to incorporate into their programming with clients an assessment tool where they ask, do you have access to a laptop? Do you have internet in your home? Do you have a smartphone? So that you know um, at the beginning whether or not this is even an op option for that client specifically. Now I have a lot of clients that have access to technology but would really prefer face-to-face. -face. They don't wanna do this technology thing. So we also need to take into consideration what is it that the client wants. Now, right now, telehealth is the option because of COVID-19 and it's helping to reduce risk. After we are clear to go back into doing face-to-face -face programming, you're gonna have some clients that would prefer telehealth and wanna stay on that format. And you're gonna have some clients that say, no, I just wanna do the face-to-face. -face. So we really need to listen to what our clients are saying and take that into consideration. Also, we need to train students to understand they need to obtain an informed consent that includes telehealth as part of that verbiage. Historically, they've already collected informed consent in order to provide service delivery, but it probably didn't include information about telehealth. We are going to link you um, to our website that will give you a sample social work, NASW, National Association of School Social, of social Workers, uh, created an, a sample informed consent for telehealth. We're going to post that so you can utilize that and adapt it for your practice, but you can also use it and embed that into your coursework as you're teaching students as what their sample consent should look like or what it should include. It's also important to encourage students to understand what their state laws are around telehealth. Um, currently, telehealth is uh, provided widely across the nation. There aren't a lot of restrictions because of COVID-19. However, each state has their own regulating laws around who can provide telehealth and the credentialing needed.
Also, students need to think about professional liability insurance. There are now offers for professional liability insurance to also include telehealth in their programming. So that's something to think about and encourage them to do. Also, verifying the client's identity making sure that when you get on that computer, the person I'm talking to is the person I'm supposed to be talking to. So ensuring that your intake includes a visual representation of that individual so that when you put eyes on them, you can go, yep, I validate that that is the right person because I have a copy of their driver's license on, on file here, so I'm talking to the appropriate person. Also maintaining that consistency around, is telehealth helping my client? So assessing progress in, in treatment is important. Uh, we can do that in mental health through what we call rapid uh, screening assessments or rapid assessment instruments, where I might ask the client every time I meet with them in telehealth to fill out an inventory, very quick five second survey that's gonna give me an idea of the level of anxiety or depression or stress that they're currently under. And then I can track over time whether or not that is improving with this telehealth intervention. And then we talked about glitches and being prepared for a backup plan. So when we think about HIPAA compliant platforms, um, there are a lot that you can choose from. Here is just a small sample of some of the ones that are available. So you want to make sure that the system that you are picking does have a HIPAA business association agreement that indicates that they are HIPAA compliant. Many people ask, well, I heard Zoom's not HIPAA compliant. It is if you get the correct one. So Zoom for Healthcare is the type of platform you would need to ensure that Zoom is HIPAA compliant for the service delivery that you're providing. So you need to make sure when you're picking that platform that you're asking those questions and the platform that you're choosing really does secure that information to ensure uh, confidentiality and safety of our clients. Preparing and safety planning for telehealth. Another thing we need to be prepared for and we need to be training our students to prepare for is what if we get into a telehealth session and this client's in crisis, this patient's in crisis, what do I do to support them because I'm hundreds of miles away? How am I going to help them? Uh, so making sure that you're creating an emergency plan and that should be started very early in that therapy process or that intervention process so that you have the plan in place in case something occurs. That would be including emergency contact information for your local emergency personnel in your area or where the client actually resides. Uh, emergency contacts specifically for the client should be on file before you start services a contingency plan for that technical failure, being able to say, if we get disconnected, I'm gonna jump right on a phone call and connect with you. And then planning in, this, in, in the event that the client is um, self-injurious or they have thoughts of self-harm or there are domestic violence situations happening in that home environment, planning that out and being prepared on how you're going to address it within this telehealth platform. Also having a resource directory of community resources available. Again, this client might not be in your region. So you need to also be knowledgeable about what resources are available to that client in the local community. And then what happens if there's a breach of client information. So that needs to be also included in your informed consent. What the what you will do as a practitioner if for some reason their protected information uh, was uh, incidentally leaked or somebody came into the room while they were doing their session. So these are things that we need our students to be planning for and to be trained in so that they can provide effective service delivery. All right, and I'm gonna pass it over to Annie. Hey, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see, yes. All right, so next we are going to talk about um, something called behavior skills training or BST. Um, so uh, behavior skills training breaks down to four simple steps. Um, this should be familiar to you even if you've never heard this term. So first you're going to introduce the topic that you're going to be training your student on. Um, next you're going to model those behaviors within that skill set so that they can see how it's done. Um, after that, you provide them with opportunities to engage in the skill themselves and you provide them with feedback as they go along. Um, and once they get proficient at doing this in a practice session, then you can uh, provide opportunities for independent responding. Um, so less support, less prompting, um, more uh, naturalistic type um, experiences for the student. Um, behavior skills training is used in a wide variety of um, training scenarios, such as the Red Cross's CPR trainings. 
Um, there is a social curriculum called skill streaming uh, that also uses uh, BST. Um, they refer to the steps as introduction, I do, we do, you do, which I really like. Um, safety care training, which is a crisis prevention um, kind of training, um, they also do this. Um, and you might even be doing this and you didn't even realize it. So kudos to you for uh, using an evidence-based practice. So uh, let's look at these individual steps. Um, when you are introducing the topic, um, this can be a helpful step to take because for one, it helps build buy-in. Why do I need to know this skill or um, why do I need to know it more in depth than I think I already do? Um, it can help the, uh, the student understand when they're going to need to use this skill and explain relevant options for utilizing the skill. So sometimes you do it this way, other times you do it another way. Um, it can also cue the learner into what it is you're about to model. So say you're modeling a very complex skill or something that's very nuanced, like communicating with a client, um, it can kind of cue them in on what exactly it is you're trying to get them to glean from your modeling. Um, introducing the topic doesn't necessarily mean that you have to sit down and tell them everything. Um, this can begin with a written assignment, such as an article or a book chapter. Um, you can just simply review the steps. Um, you can just state a few sentences about what's about to happen uh, or provide an entire lesson. Uh, a lot of the people that we are teaching are at, um, already engaged in coursework and so they may not need a whole lot of introduction to the topic because they just took a whole class on it. Um, and so next we're going to talk about breaking down the steps um, for modeling. So you definitely want to know what skills you want the student to demonstrate here. Um, this is Crucial step one, if you don't know what it is you want them to learn, you can't really demonstrate it very well. Um, you also wanna have an idea for what context it needs to be modeled in. So um, it may work very well in a role-playing scenario or it really may not. Um, you may have to show them in, in real life what this behavior looks like or what the skill set looks like. Um, keep in mind what some bad examples might be and you might even consider demonstrating this for the client or for your student um, so that they don't have to experience the contingencies that come with that working with a client. So you can say, you know, you don't want to do it this way because this can happen and this can happen, um, X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> if you do make an error while you are modeling the behavior for the student, discuss it, bring it up. Um, we all make mistakes uh, and that's a learning opportunity for your student as well. Um, not only does it show them what happens when you make that error, but it also tells them how can I fix this? Um, and then it's always a good idea to um, debrief and come back, um, you know, have a brief meeting after they've um, observed you and say, you know, what did you see? What did you like? How are you feeling about doing this step yourself? Um, and then for each of these steps, we want to have some criteria for moving on to the next step. Um, so with modeling, um, while the student is observing, it might be a simple criteria such as you need to observe this many hours or you need to observe the skill in this many scenarios, or it may be more uh, complicated. Like I need you to be able to tell me exactly what the skill is and what you saw before you're able to practice this yourself because this is a serious kind of thing. Um, next, we're going to talk about practice with feedback. Um, so this is sort of the we do component of this. Um, so whenever possible, you want to begin this in a safe space. So if you can practice this skill without um, your learner having to come into some more serious contingencies of making, you know, if, if they make a mistake and it could hurt somebody, that's maybe not the best place to start. Um, if you can take it a step back and do it more in a role playing scenario or, um, you know, engage in the activity without an audience. So that way, if you have to give feedback, it's not so aversive to the, the learner. Um, it may make sense to break the skill set down into smaller components and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get you up to this part. And then I just want you to practice this one portion of the skill set. And then once you get good at that, we're going to add in another piece and another piece and another piece. Um, and then we want to talk about feedback. Um, so feedback is best when it happens immediately. Um, if you see them making an error, if you can interrupt that error before it even finishes occurring, that's the best case scenario. But if not, as soon as you can, that's the best time to do it. Um, when you're giving feedback, you wanna be clear about, um, you know, these are the things that you did really well. Keep doing these things. When we reinforce the appropriate behaviors, we're making those behaviors stronger and stronger in the future. And that's exactly what we're here to do. We also wanna be clear about, um, what what the error was and how they can fix it. So giving them some alternative behaviors to engage in so that way the next time they practice the skill, they'll know what to do instead. Um, and then best case scenario, if you have to give feedback that's um, a redirection, 
then um, they would also immediately have an opportunity to practice the skill again. Of course, that's best case scenario. That's not always real life. Um, and again, we want to have a um, criteria for moving to the next step. Um, and so that might be that you demonstrate this this many times at this percentage correct or that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, this isn't necessary, but I think it's really, really helpful to have um, something tangible like a checklist or a rubric. Um, and that can be where that criteria comes from. So here's the rubric I've given you. You've scored this well on it. Um, I think we can do this two more times and you can move on to the next step. Or, you know, here's the rubric. You've got a lot to learn, but, you know, you'll see over time that your score is improving, um, you know, over and over again. So uh, last step is going to be independent responding and generalization. So this is when you let your little birdies fly from the nest. Um, we want to set them up for success here and make sure that we aren't putting them in the most difficult situation <laughs> right off the bat. Um, this should be the time that they are going into the field without you or without your prompting. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're building them up with small victories whenever possible. Um, you want to be available for support. So, um, you know, let them know how they can reach out to you if they need help or um, that kind of thing. But also, we don't want to be too available for support because I think we've all had those students who aren't as confident as they should be, even though they're doing fine. And if you're around, they will always lean on you, even though they can totally do this on their own. Um, and so, um, you know, in the clinic, um, when we're practicing together, I'm always in the room with my student. But then when they get to this point, I take a step out and I'm watching them through the peephole or I'm watching them through, um, you know, our um, the viewing windows or that kind of thing. When I used to work at a school, I was training students then, um, I would have them, you know, I would tell them that I have a meeting that day and I would just go either sit in the parking lot or even out at uh, the Starbucks around the corner. I would be really close in case things went south, but I, you know, at that point we knew that things weren't gonna go south. That student had it. Um, and we wanna keep in mind too, that even though um, our students have demonstrated that they are proficient in these skills, New scenarios could still be tricky. Um, we may still want to provide some additional support um, in hairier situations. So um, that's kind of a nuanced um, situation that you're going to have to see to for yourself and for your students. Um, some peak performances and pitfalls. So you're doing BST very well if you are using data to decide which step your learner is ready for. Um, you're doing a great job if you are letting go of the reins as they meet criteria and letting them uh, progress on their own. Um, if you have a plan for when to step in and provide unsolicited support. So with each step and with each skill, you should have a line in the sand that says, I'm going to let you make, you know, I'm going to let you test the waters up to here, but if things get this bad, I'm jumping in and I don't care whose feelings get hurt. Um, you should have a system for providing feedback as often as possible. When we are, um, if you provide feedback after every session, then it doesn't come as a shock when you have to provide redirection in that feedback. Um, and so you want it to just be a part of your natural training. Um, and then if you're reinforcing your learner's achievements, you're doing a fantastic job because again, that's how we strengthen those skills that we want them to be um, doing. Um, so you're missing opportunities in BST if you are using trial by fire. If you say, let's just see how you do and throw them into the scenario, um, you're maybe not setting your student up for success at that point. Um, same thing if you sort of push them ahead before you know for sure that they are ready. Um, if you're not using data to drive that decision, then you might be putting them in a situation that they're not ready for. Um, on the flip side, if you keep your learner at the same step for too long, then you're not allowing them the opportunity to gain that independence and to gain that autonomy and to gain that confidence as well. Um, you want to make sure that you are addressing your own errors um, as you are modeling, as you are engaging in these skills with your students. Again, that's a learning opportunity for them, and that's a failure that they may not have to engage in, in their, on their own to see what happens. Um, if you're only acknowledging your learner's errors, then um, you know that's not a very supportive environment for them, and it could you know run create some problems later down the road because they may not come to you when they actually do need help. Um, and on the flip side of that, if you never acknowledge your learner's errors, then you're really doing them a disservice because you know they don't even know that they have room to improve if you're not telling them what those errors are and how they can do it. <clears throat> so let's talk about what this looks like in telehealth. Um, so I'm a behavior analyst. Um, we look at behaviors. 
Uh, and so uh, one of the assessments we use is called the FAST. It's a questionnaire. It's got about 27 questions on it. it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do. Um, our students are going to be introduced to this through coursework. I don't need to spend a whole lot of time going over what we're about to do with the FAST. Um, and so we can get on to step two once I know they've had that class. Um, so students are going to observe me interacting with the parent. I might tell them ahead of time, like, you know, around this question, I reword it, or, you know, if the parent's demonstrating these behaviors that tell me that they're unsure, I might validate their answers in this way. Um, and then, you know, they'll observe, we debrief afterwards and talk about the things that they saw. Um, after they've done that a few times and, um, you know, feel comfortable, then um, we are going to have them, I'm gonna have my students conduct the assessments with each other. Um, and lately we've been doing that just using the video conferencing um, services available to us. Um, as they do that, you know, I'm interrupting and telling them like, ah, no, do it this way, don't do it that way. Um, and once they are able to demonstrate that they can assess each other fluently, then they're allowed to um, move on to assessing the client also using video chat um, platforms. Um, an unofficial step, we celebrate. Great job. I love how you're, you know, gaining independence in this. You did such a good job talking to the parent this way. Fantastic. I'm so glad you're my student. Um, in total, this took about three 20 minute sessions, not including whatever coursework they had on um, doing this assessment. Uh, another example is data collection. Um, and so they're going to get tons and tons of coursework on this topic. Um, and then in addition to that, we're going to talk about this by reviewing our data sheets and reviewing the definitions we use to guide um, our data collection. Um, I'm going to model this behavior using scenarios or, um, you know, if we have video recordings, which we sometimes have in the clinic, we might use those, but we haven't had that right now. Um, so we'll use videos, we'll use the whiteboard function on the BlueJeans app that we use. And I can just model for them. Here's how you collect data. Uh, you know, I would mark this box. I wouldn't mark this one. Um, they ask their questions. We get feedback. And then they're allowed to try it on their own. Um, once they're demonstrating proficiency um, in that uh, training session, then they're allowed to collect data in observation sessions. Um, total time, this took about 45 minutes for steps one through three, and then about a 30 minute to hour long observation session with the client. Um, communicating with parents is a much more nuanced thing that we do. And so, um, you know, this one looks a little different from the other one. So we need to talk to parents about problem behaviors. We talk to them about potential interventions um, and, you know, just a variety of things that um, require some different skill sets than what you might learn in a college class. Um, so we have an in-depth pre-meeting with an outline. So I'm going to discuss with my student before any time we talk to a parent. Here are the things we're going to talk about. Here's what we want to make sure they understand, so on and so forth. They're going to observe me talking with parents over and over and over again um, before they have the opportunity to practice this themselves. Um, and so I want to make sure that they're, you know, you know, they have questions, that they are asking those questions, and that they understand the whole point of, you know, why we do things the way we do when we're talking with parents versus when we're talking to another professional. Um, once they demonstrate that they are ready, um, I have them practice with me um, in very specific scenarios. So I just want you to tell this parent about this one thing. I'm going to tell them the rest. Um, they practice with me. They provide me an overview of what they're going to say. We might even do some role playing uh, where I'm going to pretend to be this mom or this dad in that scenario. Um, once that's all good, uh, then they have the opportunity to, um, you know, communicate with the parents. I observe, I give feedback um, as needed. Unofficial stuff we're going to celebrate. You did such a good job, you know, breaking that thing down for that parent. I love how you didn't use scientific terms for this person who's, you know, they're worried about their kid. They don't care about the science. Um, total time. This is something that takes many months, if not years. This is something that students may come back and seek additional mentorship for, and that's perfectly fine. Um, so I want to be clear that this isn't something that is necessarily one and done, but we do want to make sure that we have some criteria for saying that you are proficient in this skill. Our last example is going to be um, analyzing data and making decisions. So again, they're going to get lots and lots of coursework on this. Um, and then we're also going to talk about what clinically significant changes look like for our individuals. Um, we have weekly meetings where we review this together. During those meetings, initially, I'm going to make all the decisions and I'm going to explain why I'm making those decisions. My students have the opportunity to ask questions, um, but that's really all they get to do. Um, once they've reached a certain point in their coursework and once they've you know, been through so many sessions with me, 
then I'm going to start asking them, what do you think we should do? You know, what, is, what do these data tell you? Um, and then we'll discuss from there. And then once they're consistently making accurate decisions, um, I'm going to let them make those decisions on their own. And all they have to do is run it by me um, before they put it, you know, officially in the paperwork. Um, our unofficial step is always going to be to celebrate. I love how you're making progress in this. I love how you're really understanding this. Um, you're going to be a great BCBA one day. Um, and again, this is something that took um, multiple months, if not years. This may be something that students seek mentorship um, for later on. So that is uh, VST in a nutshell. I hope that was beneficial for you. Linda, you're up. I am. Um, here I go. Okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. So, is it up now? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, allowing me to um, share our uh, experiences here at the College of Nursing. Um, as um, let me see. There we go. So um, is that? It's not going right. Sorry. I'm having a little trouble here. There we go. Okay, now I found it. Thank you. So, sorry about that. Um, as you know, um, the COVID um, virus has made it very uh, unprecedented public health crisis, but it also made a crisis for um, the College of Nursing and how we um, approach students and where they were. We pulled students out in the middle of the term and um, so there was a lot of things that we still needed to do with students and we thought that maybe telehealth might help. Um, uh, as you know, uh, telehealth is not really new in healthcare. It's been going on for quite a while. <clears throat> um, we just didn't always call it that. That's kind of the new thing. Um, but it has been merging uh, recently, in recent months, as a primary source of, uh, of addressing um, the healthcare needs of patients. Um, and uh, because it enables providers, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, um, physicians assistants, and patients to remain separate um, while participating in the healthcare delivery system. For uh, example, my, where I work in a small community, uh, patients were not allowed to come into the uh, clinic for quite a while because um, we were afraid of transmission of the virus. Um, and, um, but this way we can also interact with nurses who are still going into the homes. Um, to look at um, the challenge of clinical testing for our students, uh, which was um, big for us. Um, we have established that uh, we've done simulation with students, uh, in, uh, nurse practitioner students, and we have done uh, OSCE testing with students. Uh, now, for those of you who are not familiar with OSCEs, they are objective standardized clinical exams. Um, they've been around since the 70s in med school, um, and we've been using them here since 2009. And what happens is that we have a standardized patient. Uh, we've trained the standardized patient to act out certain uh, patient scenarios, uh, certain um, disease entities, and the student is um, evaluated as they go through uh, seeing the patient as if they were the provider and seeing a real patient. Um, that uh, we have done a really nice job, I think, here of um, getting that to be better and better and, and having more and more standardized patients. Um, <clears throat> um, let me see. Um, so this has been a standard of how we test students. Now, the way we usually uh, evaluate students beforehand is we go into the clinical area. Because uh, COVID-19 stopped us in the middle, um, some students had been uh, seen and evaluated and some had not been seen and evaluated. Um, part of the challenge of clinical testing using um, telemedicine was no one on faculty actually had any true prior experience. I had been on, in on a couple of sessions of telehealth with uh, folks, but had not been on very many, and I was the only um, instructor who had done so. There's also, when we started looking at the literature uh, about the educational process for nurse practitioner students about telemedicine, there is not very much literature. Um, so we gathered as much as we could. There's also a shortage of health uh, professional programs that actually integrate training into telemedicine uh, for their curriculum. 
so the instructors, uh, faculty of the FNP program, really had to do some brainstorming and we had to have some um, uh, Zoom meetings in order to, um, to figure out what we were going to do with students. Oh, goodness. Uh oh, where's my screen? Screen disappeared. Uh oh. I don't know what my my screen disappeared. Rami, can you help? Uh, sure, uh, Blenda, uh, Blenda, can you try sharing your screen again? It should be on. Uh, screen share should be on. Oh no, oh no. You may have clicked out of your presentation. I should get back. Oh no. Okay, I'm I'm so sorry. That's okay. um, can I just go ahead and, and talk about what we did? I can I can do that. Sure. Um, yeah, then you don't need to share your screen at that point. We can just have you full screen up on okay, the video. I'm, it says I'm sharing, but I don't I don't know what happened to it. I apologize. It's um my first one. Anyway, um so um where was I? Talking about uh performance. I, I apologize. Um Okay, so we really did some brainstorming of what we could do with students and how we could uh, approach students uh, in order to, to actually um, train them to do telemedicine as we were uh, being trained. Uh, first of all, we need to look at our curriculum objectives and those are listed uh, for you. Uh, and you'll see them on your, um, when, you, when you get your, um, your uh, PowerPoint uh, copies, but they are, um, we looked at patient centered communication skills, and this one was particularly important. Students, uh, nursing students in particular, and it's probably true for other students who have a lot of hands on kinds of skills. Um, they look at um, learning those skills as really being the most wonderful skills that they can do. You know, they want to learn to do suturing and they want to learn to do uh, pelvic exams and and, uh, and how to inject joints and how to do office procedures. When actuality, um, those are kind of the nice things, but most of the bread and butter of what nurse practitioners and physicians and PAs do is uh, history taking. And if we uh, believe uh, what we tell students, and that is 90% of getting a diagnosis, a true diagnosis, is knowing how to take a history. Um, we really need to um, focus in on that as much as possible, but students want to hear that. Well, when you do telemedicine, that is exactly what the students uh, have to focus in on. And um, so we were really able to assess their skills with that. And that was um, something that, that came from it that we were not expecting. So um, what did we do? How did we get it together? <clears throat> um, we got as much content together as possible, and I'll be able, I'll share whatever I have if you email me uh, about um, uh, telehealth. And we gave a little didactic, didactic information to the students. Um, we contacted standardized patients that we had used in the past, and these standardized, we used those people thinking that maybe since they had already been standardized patients, it would be less intimidating, um, but I'm not really sure that that was the wisest thing to do. Someone uh, said, well, maybe they already have a, an idea of what they should do, and so it might backfire, but it worked out pretty well. Um, we um, had to... Um, uh, train the standardized patients remotely. Uh, it was a one-on-one -on -one training when many times it's um, more faculty um, train uh, one uh, standardized patient or one, one faculty does many standardized patients, but this way it was just a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we also then decided that we really need to know a little bit more about what we were doing. So we did trial runs, each taking um, the point of being the uh, student as well as the instructor who was grading them. And we uh, graded as we went so that we could give immediate feedback. Step-by-step uh, -step instructions were then written. Uh, when we practiced, they were again revised and rewritten a couple of times. And then we shared those with students, um, <clears throat> including um, a revised evaluation tool because we had more focus on the history taking and the communication skills. We needed to really revise that uh, our evaluation tool um, to, uh, to keep in accordance with that. Um, 
The telehealth OSCEs took place if the student had at least 90% of their clinical hours and their patient loads uh, tallied. Again, we stopped clinical uh, about midterm, just after the midterm. And um, so not all students who were in the program at the time were eligible, which made it a bit manageable for us since it was our first time um, in order to do this kind of testing. Um, and we used, um, we used Zoom uh, in order to do that. Um, so let me just um, say, here's some lessons that we learned um, because we're still learning them. Um, the telehealth um, OSCE, or we now call it the tel OSCE, um, was well received by both students and, and faculty. Students were of course a bit nervous at the beginning, but they're also nervous when they do um, a one-on-one -on -one face to face uh, OSCE. Um, it, but it, they said that it made them a little bit more aware of the different models that are out there, including telehealth. <clears throat> um, the tel OSCE is also very easily adaptable. Um, we were able to adapt a bit more, um, use our standardized patients in a, a lot more varied ways because it's, we are not constrained by physical constraints. Um, the scenario can be adapted to fit the needs and the complexity of different situations and different learner levels. For instance, uh, our residency students or those getting ready to graduate have a much more complicated standardized patient um, with a lot more complications uh, physically and uh, diagnostically. And we can make them, um, those uh, scenarios a lot simpler or a lot more complicated as without using a lot of different technology. We're in the past uh, standardized patients who presented with certain things. We would have to have pictures. We could, um, uh, we may have to have some moulage and we don't have to do that with, um, with uh, these kind of OSCEs. <clears throat> um, we also um, were able to um, expose a student more to um, a model of primary care that is with rural and underserved populations. Some of our students are in the rural area and we are certainly dedicated to trying to provide more um, primary care providers in the rural area. And um, with our standardized patients, they could become more of a rural person instead of coming in here to Memphis. Um, and we could uh, also uh, it, expose uh, students to a little bit more of what's happening in a home situation as um, someone else has already talked about. Um, right now we are making plans to implement um, not only into um, summative evaluation but also uh, uh, formative. Our student population is um, widely spread out over Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, and uh, Arkansas and our um, what we do now is we visit the students a couple of times each semester in the clinic where they are. Uh, many times that is uh, almost cost prohibitive. Uh, it is certainly time prohibitive to do that. When, uh, uh, for instance, last term I had students in Savannah, Tennessee and in Fort Smith, Arkansas, as well as Greenwood, Mississippi, making that travel um, with all the other obligations that are necessary um, makes it difficult and makes it more expensive. And also we can decrease the amount of times that the students have to come on campus, which is something that we need to do with our, um, our global initiative with, at the U of M. Um, I think that um, this is gonna be a lot more convenient uh, as well as um, I think it's gonna, it's here to stay. People are saying, well, it may, uh, telemedicine is just kind of a fluke, but I'm, I'm in agreement with my, my other two peers and that it is, it is here to stay. Uh, part of the problem, of course, in medicine is that um, we're not being paid. It got expanded for a little while, but uh, telemedicine is not as uh, lucrative for some folks, or that's what I'm hearing. But we're still learning a lot about it, and it's um, it's been a real challenge, and it's also been a lot of fun. I got to tell you, um, we've I've really enjoyed learning this, and I'm glad that it pushed us into it. <laughs> so. Um, I'll be, uh, if anyone else has any ideas out there, I'm glad to hear them, but I'm glad to share whatever we've learned. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Thank you, all three of you. And it, it just shows that the flexibility 
of all three of your professions and how you're dedicated to teaching your students. And I, I agree with you, Belinda, and, and the other ladies that telehealth is here to stay. And um, you're teaching your students the trend of the future. So let's open it up now. Um, we had one question for Annie. Uh, Ms. Cornelius, would you, could you give some examples of topics or skills for which BST could be effectively utilized? Sure. And so um, kind of like I said uh, in my first slide, really it can be used for any skill that can be uh, demonstrated. And so, um, for example, I've used this um, kind of training to teach social skills to children. Um, some of them have autism, some of them don't, they're just quirky kids. Um, but uh, in a similar way, you, you know, tell them why they need this particular skill. So for example, um, one of the lessons we did was on knowing when to um, tattle on a friend versus knowing when to ignore or deal with it yourself. Um, and so um, I kind of, I started with, you know, a couple of different stories that were related to the topic and um, then told them exactly what the steps were going to be. And then um, I had a board of just different scenarios. It would have a picture of, for example, like a kid who was holding his knee and looked like he was hurt. And that's a good time to go tell a teacher versus, you know, a kid is just making some funny noises and probably just ignore it. And so I would, you know, show them the card and tell them what's going on and say, you know, think to myself, what do I do here? You know, model all the behaviors. And then, you know, the next step would be for them to come up and, um, you know, they would draw a card from a, a hat and whatever the scenario was, then they had to go through the steps. You know, is someone getting hurt? Do I need to do this? You know, we'd kind of talk through it. And then after a few times of doing that, once um, students were more comfortable and, you know, not needing as much prompting with the steps, um, then, um, you know, we would play um, different games where, you know, someone might do one of these behaviors and that kind of thing. And I would just decide then if they needed more intervention on the skill, um, like if they were able to use those steps on their own versus, um, you know, if they, you know, made the wrong choice and they tattled on someone who, you know, really didn't need to be tattled on or, you know, saw somebody did actually get bumped into and didn't go tell a teacher, that kind of thing. Um, so that's one example. Um, you know, it's the same, it's really any skill. Uh, if you want help applying this to, you um, the things that you do in your practice. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of talk about it more in depth, but like I said, I feel like this applies to really any skill. Um, and at this point, I'd like to remind people who need the CEU for behavior analysts that the post, the checkout code is 8074. 8074. Um, any other, I don't see any, oh wait, I do have some more questions. Let's see. Um, everyone is just very complimentary of our three presenters. That's it's, uh, and and I agree. You've done a terrific job. Um, do you want? Do you ladies want to give your email addresses in case people want to contact you individually, Susan? I'll actually post mine in the chat so everybody can access it. Okay. Okay. And. Annie and Belinda, if you want to post your um, email addresses there. Let's see if we have any more. We have some more questions. Let's see. Um, another question for Annie. Do you have any tips for utilizing BST while working with a group of students on telehealth as opposed to one individual? Um, yeah, so I think... Um... BST works well in groups as far as um, it kind of comes down to divide and conquer. There are certain parts that you can do really well with the group and certain parts that you kind of need to split them up. And so um, certainly the first two steps lend themselves very, very easily to group formats. So, um, you know, telling the students what they're about to learn or, you know, introducing the topic. Um, they can be reading the same material. You can do a lecture or a course on it um, that kind of thing. Same thing for modeling. When we were doing the assessments, um, you know, it's not something that we do all the time. So if I was going to do an assessment, I might have a couple of different students on that conference call. Um, and we had them blank out their screens so the parents didn't see like all these faces <laughs> watching them, um, even though they consented to it. Um, but that, you know, modeling piece, uh, that's also something that's pretty easily done in the group. And then, um, you know, 
you can kind of, depending on the skill, you can split students up for that practice piece. And so, um, for example, going back to that same assessment, I would have students assess each other. Um, since it's a questionnaire, they could ask each other questions about their own clients um, and um, practice in that way. So that way, um, both students were getting the experience of the practice without um, having to necessarily do one-on-one -on -one just with me. Um, and then, um, but then kind of after that, it, it's a lot easier to do, um, or it makes more sense to do an individual kind of formats. You know, um, if, you're, if you're really assessing to see if a student has the skill, you wanna have all of your attention focused on that one student, depending on the skill, um, yeah. And then uh, our time is running out. We have two quick questions for Dr. Ellswick. Uh, number one, what would be the reason that the computer or laptop needs to be no older than three years old when delivering telehealth? That's the first question. That's a great question. So one of the reasons is because of technology support. Um, so I'll give an example. In my practice, we used to offer Chromebooks for our clinicians, but after about three years, depending on what year your Chromebook is, they stop supporting it, which means that they can no longer do updates on that technology, which means that that makes that technology vulnerable. And so just making sure you have the most updated technology assists with making sure that you can keep uh, the tech updates available, um, that they're being supported by by, um, IT and that way it's going to keep your comp uh, confidentiality and your materials secure for your clients. And then we had another question. Um, can you share what type of consent you use for your practice and how do you provide this consent to your patient? Excellent. So we will actually post the NASW has a really great uh, sample consent that we'll post that you can utilize. It's an open document that they're allowing public to use. You can adapt it to your practice. You can add it to your current consent. It just includes that telehealth uh, uh, content and verbiage. Um, so that I, I did model mine after the NASW one uh, when we were kind of thrown into this because I do run a private practice as well. And now, now moving forward, every client that is new to our practice will have that embedded in our normal consent packet. But we were working with clients that didn't give consent initially for telehealth and now we're doing telehealth. So we actually had to go back in and uh, share the consent for telehealth with all of our clients that we were currently providing service delivery for, get those consents in advance before we started telehealth programming. Um, some of our, our, our clients, we actually emailed that content to them and they were able to scan and email it back. Some of them, we did it through a live consent on Zoom where we were able to access that, but they just need to understand what are their rights and responsibilities around telehealth? Um, what are the risks and benefits? Just the exact same things you would cover in an initial consent, but it's just more related to the technology piece of things. But we will provide you um, on our website a link to that NASW sample that you can use in practice. Thank you very much. We are running out of time. And at this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Ellswick, Ms. Cornelius, and Dr. Fleming for the terrific job answering questions and presenting very important information. I'd also like to thank the FedEx Institute and in particular, Rami Lotte for his work today in helping us organize the webinar. So until next time, um, you will get a follow, all the participants will get a follow-up email with the links to the presentations, the links to the PowerPoint and the survey. So we'll sign off. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.